Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susan Derwin. I'm the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's event, which is part of the Center's Imagining California series. As the public face of humanities for the campus, our center mounts programs that draw upon the expertise and skills associated with the humanities to, to support scholars in the production of new knowledge and to empower community members as agents of social change. I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people, the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center is located, and I would like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, as well as other indigenous people present. I must say I was delighted when Charles Lester contacted me last fall regarding our Imagining California series. Charles suggested that we might put together an event with Rosanna Ja about her then forthcoming book on sea level rise in California. And I knew that this would make an important contribution to our series, which throughout the year has been exploring the challenges that define California, the dreams that informed California's past, and the new imaginings that can inspire its future. And in this context, I welcomed the chance to learn about Jaw's work on the disappearing California coast and her understanding of the urgent need to communicate about this pressing environmental issue. A Tufts University graduate, Rosanna Shaw is an environmental reporter for the Los Angeles Times, where she specializes in stories about the coast and ocean. She was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2020 for explanatory reporting, and her coverage of the, a toxic dump site in the deep ocean has been anthologized in the Best American Science and Nature Writing series. She has also written about topics such as the impacts of coast gentrification and the seizure of Bruce's Beach from its black proprietors. Jaw's article about the beach was instrumental in the return of the land in 2022 to the descendants of the black owners. And Jaw will be in conversation today about her new book, California Against the Sea, with Charles Lester, director of the Ocean and Coastal Policy Center in the Marine Sciences Institute at UC Santa Barbara, where he researches, writes, and advises about sea level rise, coastal resilience, and other aspects of coastal law, policy, and management. I am grateful to our co-sponsors, Professor Lester's Ocean and Coastal Policy Center, as well as the Environmental Studies Program and the Marine Science Institute. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Rosanna Ja and Charles Lester, please. Thank you, Susan. Thank you to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. And um, yeah, it's truly an honor to be here. I'm so just stunned by all the face, familiar faces that I see. And I'm just, it's so lucky. We are so lucky to hear from Charles today as well. And it's an honor to be in conversation with you. And just, what did I just say? All of the things I learned about the coast and this issue really began and is grounded in kind of Charles's perspective. And um, Charles has been working on this issue and thinking about this issue way longer than I have. So um, we are really lucky to have you here today. And I, I just, I will say, you know, Jenny Dugan, Dave Hubbard, there are just so many wonderful people who are also featured in this book. And none of the work, no, this book would not exist without all of the hard work from so many folks in this room. And um, I'm just seeing so many familiar faces. Jacob Schmidt, Dave Valentine, also the coastal and marine research happening on this campus, I continue to be in awe of. And you know, I write about things beyond sea level rise too, so I'm just grateful to see so many cool silo, like so many different fields of science coming together in this room. I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> Well, you're, you're too kind. It's my honor to be here to talk with you today um, about this amazing book. Um, yeah, I've been working on this stuff and thinking about it a long time, but you know, the way you synthesize things and bring, to get, bring together all of these different pieces, which I hopefully will get to many of them, uh, is amazing. So it's, it's my honor. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the, the introductory s section, but I did my first question for you as an LA Times reporter is, do you mind if I record this? <laughs> and it, it's, just for, it's just for my notes. And at any time you're uncomfortable, we can go off the record, background, whatever. <laughs> okay. I agree to be recorded. Okay. Off the record, this is how we start all our conversations in reverse, usually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so all of this is on background. Um, so, as a reporter, you're doing environmental reporting. What, what inspired you to go from 
that uh, daily writing of stories that come and go, perhaps, to writing a book about this? You know, what, what was the inspiration? Yeah, and I, I've been thinking a lot about this question, and the answer had has been coming into greater and greater clarity for me, and I think, so a couple steps here. I mean, to start, I mean, quick crash course on the way the LA Times structures our environmental coverage. So we have a number of reporters who are each in charge of a certain aspect of the landscape. So I am in charge of the coast and the entire Pacific Ocean. We have a reporter in charge of water. And so Ian James, he's a fantastic reporter. We joke that all the water until it gets to the beach is his, and then I have the rest of it, and then we fight over wetlands and whether it's fresh water or salt, too salty for him. I'm kidding, but you know, obviously, we he has to think about drought and river systems, and I think about more intertidal systems and coastal systems, and also the marine, the greater ocean and marine environment. We have a wildfire reporter and air quality reporter. We have someone who covers the high desert, and you know, because of all these different subspecialties, I have the privilege of really just focusing on coastal and ocean issues. And you know, I look at other smaller newsrooms who have one climate change reporter or one environment reporter, and they end up having to cover everything. Like, thank goodness I don't have to think about the Keeling curve like most of the time. And, <laughs> and yeah, so from there, I start to think about you know, climate change issues that are specific to my specialty. And you know that's ocean acidification, and sea level rise is obviously a looming one. And for a couple of years, I was writing about sea level rise in the way like an old school newspaper reporter would write it. A new study comes out that find that projects that the ocean's going to rise as much as seven feet by the end of the century in California. You know, it's all right like a new study fat, you know, projects that blah 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 blah. Another study was like more than two thirds of our beaches in California could vanish by the end of the century if we continue business as usual. Salt, salt marshes could extinct, go extinct completely as an ecosystem along the Pacific coast if we continue business as usual. And so all of these studies and new projections and news reports were became these like kind of drumbeat news articles that I wrote. But I noticed that I'd write it and make a splash. The next day, people move on to the next story and the next issue and the next crisis. And so I did have this moment a couple of years ago thinking about how do I keep this topic in conversation and how, how do we start to, like how, and recognizing too that like we can't science our way out of this issue. It is not sea level rise adaptation, climate change is not just a science issue. It's also not just a political issue. And so I started to think about what it would mean to write a book. I'm still questioning that decision <laughs> many years later. and. You know, I started to talk to publishers and started agents and kind of thinking about what it would mean to turn my reporting into a book. And a lot of the mass market kind of responses and the default, I'm speaking very generally here, the default publishing approach to a book like this would be to go as big as possible. This is the book on sea level rise. And Ch California would be one chapter within this broader book that would take you to Miami and to Louisiana. Someone was like, you should go to Indonesia because they're relocating their entire capital. Someone else is like, Venice, Italy is drowning and going underwater. Like, so what would it look like to do this massive climate change book about sea level rise in all these different places? And as someone who has covered, you know, all these different nuances up and down the California coast, I knew that there was an entire book. And if we did just one chapter, we would end up inevitably parachuting into Malibu and writing about the same issue in the same way that you know had been perpetuated for so long in kind of the broader public discourse on this issue. So it was a matter of finding the right publisher who was willing to take a bet on a book completely about California and then to think about how to write this book that is not just about science and that's not just about policy. It's also about our social history and our relationship to land and just the story of California past, present, and future. And ultimately, it was really cool to have teamed up with this really small, this, this indie press in Berkeley, Heyday Books, I really believe in this vision. So um, yeah, I'm still kind of sharpening the way I'm thinking about why I wrote this book. But ultimately, now that it's been a couple months since this book came out, I think I ended up writing the book that I wish existed when I first started covering the coast. And you know, it, it's this really cool collection of just perspectives and voices that truly feel so California and you know yours included. And um, I've been thinking a lot about how writing this book required not just understanding the science or the policy. I used to 
you know, tell people environmental reporting is blending science and policy together, but it's also social history and politics and land use history and like all of this stuff. And I'm, I'm curious, this is where I asked Charles a question again. <laughs> so, um, I will try to not ask too many questions during this session because that's what I usually do. But how do you, from your position, like in, you know, from the Coastal Commission and now as director of the Ocean and Coastal Policy Center, like how do you kind of acknowledge and navigate the fact that all of it is interconnected? I mean, you have to know the science and the policy and, you know, how do you connect, how do you connect the dots? Because I really struggled for a really long time to figure out how to connect the dots and tell the story of California that is about everything in addition to sea level rise? Well, that's, that's a great question. I'll try not to answer too long. Um, the, uh, you know, I've always been interdisciplinary. So, um, well, not always. I, I became interdisciplinary and it was, it's always been important to me to bring disciplines together, uh, sectors together, different ways of looking at issues together. I, I started as a, a geochemistry major and was a science wonky person, the natural sciences, but quickly realized I needed to also be engaged in the social sciences, uh, ultimately law and uh, policy so, and political science. And when you work at a place like the Coastal Commission, um, there's no way around it being interdisciplinary. Uh, and I guess I've come to think about that question as um, one of, taking a problem orientation. So if you ask yourself about a problem that you want to address, um, I bet you you're going to discover that you have to know something about a different discipline in order to address the problem. You can't just address it with your own your specialized training or your own viewpoint on that particular problem, because problems are inherently multidimensional. Right? And you know, listening, you, listening to you answer that first question about uh, the push to write about California, uh, it's not quite the same thing as interdisciplinary, but I also think that California is a, um, in telling all the things you, you did about California and sea level rise, you also talked about what's happening globally, right? Because the, the issues are uh, a problem that we're experiencing at the local and state and national and global level. Now, there, there are going to be nuances and different contextual pieces and different cultural aspects to the problem. But I bet you that all of the themes that are in this book, you're going to find everywhere else they're struggling with sea level rise. So I think you uh, wrote a global book, but California is a, you know, embodies that um, connectedness of all the pieces. So, you know, how do you um, bring the pieces together? I think it's, um, it's really challenging and, and can be particularly challenging in an academic setting uh, where you know, specialization is uh, often the norm, maybe not in an interdisciplinary humanities center, which is great, and centers are often the way you can bring people together around problems or social issues. So focusing on um, a, a dominant theme or thing that's happening, um, globalization, or technology, um, artificial intelligence, you know, these things are problems that we need to address and that are gonna bring together people with different disciplinary focuses. So I think the problem orientation is, is the main idea, but getting people to focus on the problem, not their discipline, is always a challenge. Yeah, and not to get too radical too fast, <laughs> but I think what you just said is also reminding me, like, one of the kind of mind expanding moments I had as I was embarking on the book process was recognizing that, you know, telling the story of California and the coast is writing about a landscape, a landscape that doesn't adhere to property lines, jurisdictional boundaries, and that really this is a story about the intersection between land and ocean and this like constant dance and tension between the two and, you know, really re-seeing the beach and the coast and the shoreline as this dynamic space that is actually a process more than a static place and that in itself you know approaching it as a landscape rather than you know or, or you know even talking to folks like Jenny and Dave and thinking about 
the eco, like the entire ecology rather than focusing on specific species or like I'm going to talk to this plant specialist or I'm going to talk about the sand expert. It's it's really recognizing that we are talking about cohesively a story about the entire landscape and that the people in our you know societies and the laws that we've imposed upon this inherently impermanent ever moving space is part of the complication, right? Like and even just the way I broke down the LA Times environment structure, we are also you know, it's not perfect the way we structure our coverage, but we are a reflection of the silos of how natural resources are managed in this state. You know, Ian covers the water agencies and I cover the coastal agencies, right? But all of it is interconnected and, you know. I'm, yeah. Right, so the, the sociologists in the room will, will know that Durkheim said this a long time ago, right? The division of labor and society is inherently uh, focused on specializing and so we're all in our little silos, specialized to make the economy work. And it's hard to break those silos down. But um, what you said about the land and the geography, and I don't know if there are any geographers in the room, but yeah, you guys are like some of the earliest interdisciplinary um, people because you look at land, you know, spatial land, human issues and embedded in your problem of what do we do about this space that people live in with water getting higher and closer? That's a inherently um, not only dynamic, but interdisciplinary. You can't talk about that problem without understanding how land works, how, you know, how the geophysics works, how the ecology works, how the politics works for sure, how social systems work, how economic systems work. All of those things are in play. Yeah, and I just, I'm, it's like rethinking kind of the journey, because this book truly was a journey, and it became, it, it, it started as an intellectual journey, but it ultimately, my book editor was like, your book cannot, you have to think about not only the intellectual journey of the reader, but also the philosophical journey of the reader, and ultimately the emotional journey. And I feel like there were a lot of emotions that I was experiencing right. as I went deeper in this book. But I remember beginning with like, I'm going to write a book about sea level rise. This is a fun intellectual exercise on what's going to happen to the California coast given all these projections. And I remember talking to, you know, a prominent coastal engineer. You probably know who I'm talking about, but he has, you know, six licenses in six different states. And he was one of the earliest folks who came up with, did the vulnerability assessment, came up with like an adaptation, set of adaptation strategies for a community and did all the cost benefit analyses. And I remember one of, my, one of my first kind of like, whoa, moments in this journey was this engineer telling me, I did all the cost benefit analyses. I measured all the cost and trade-offs. I can tell you very, from a very clinical perspective, what the numbers say in terms of the most efficient way forward, you know, that preserves life safety, that is the best from a cost benefit perspective, but this is beyond my expertise to solve because when he introduced these numbers and these very kind of like black and white kind of ways forward, the community didn't want to hear it. There was a lot of um, emotional backlash, political backlash. And that was my first moment recognizing that you can't, it's not just a numbers game. It's not just science. It's not just engineering. There's all these other aspects to it. And ultimately, who else has to come into this conversation? And I just, it became this like, I'm going to talk to these people, and then I realized all these other people need, I should talk to, and suddenly it was like this massive party of <laughs> voices and experts talking about this one issue. And, um, and now you know what the answer is, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I will say that this book took so long. It's called California Against the Sea. I was joking with my editor that it was going to be California in the sea by the time I finished this book <laughs> <laughs> because it took so long to figure out how to write about everything. Well, you know, there's a lot, uh, there's so many things in what you just said. I know who you're talking about, I think. Um, and um, I do think, you know, we, we need to be cognizant of that tension between, oh, we can figure this out by running numbers. We can study the science, we can predict what's going to happen, and then we'll just adapt to it, right? Easy peasy. Um, no, it, there are people involved, human systems involved, difficult decisions involved at the community level that nobody has a right answer to. And so the challenge is how do we uh, work through that morass of interacting um, views and, and types of thinking yeah. to figure out the answer. And you know, there's this idea that's 
now the, the latest in vogue, right, is resilience. Right? Let's all be resilient. Um, I'll be working on a beach resiliency plan for the state going forward in the next couple of years. So well, what does that mean? And, and maybe you want to read a little bit about that? Or right. Um, yeah, I think there's this, you know, in writing this book, too, I've been thinking a lot about the words that we use to talk about this issue. And resilience was one of the words that really stumped me the further I looked into it, the further I thought about not just you know, the intellectual journey, but also the philosophical journey. And Charles actually really, we had this one conversation where it really just like blew my mind and regrounded me in thinking about what the word resilience means. And just to finish one thought from what you just said, I think too, when this engineer was telling me about the cost benefit analyses, it made me realize too, I, I was an economist by training in a different life. And it made me realize too that a lot of these models and the way we do cost benefit analyses requires us to assign value to certain things. And that the way we value things and place worth and deem something worthy of saving or worthy of this versus this is also changing and is also grounded in social structures, right? And not, again, like these numbers could change too depending on how we assign value. So that's another thought that just popped into my mind as you were talking, and this is what happens every time Charles and I talk together about this stuff. So I'm gonna read from chapter seven, and it's actually where you meet Charles in the book. And again, this is um, kind of the oh my God moment as he's kind of helping me expand the way I think about the word resilience. So I'll start a little bit with the introduction of Charles. So Lester, Charles Lester. Lester now spends his time urging coastal planners to reimagine the existing systems in which California and the rest of the country are trying to figure out sea level rise. He has consulted for Pacifica and other cities on the front lines of erosion and wrestled with the greater questions of social justice. In 2019, he took on the job of revamping the Ocean and Coastal Policy Center at UC Santa Barbara where researchers are now looking into building coastal resilience in more equitable ways. He's been mulling over this word resilience that comes up so often with climate change. For those still thinking in terms of man versus nature, resilience means having the strength to rebuild in the same place after a catastrophe, to resume life as it was before. The standard way we talk about resilience is this ability to bounce back, Lester said. Resilience is often about making sure we are strong enough to not be changed, but what if we should change? More and more sociologists, economists, even engineers are now questioning who exactly benefits from preserving the world the way it is today. Whose wealth, whose property, whose history gets preserved by maintaining the status quo? We've seen increasing gentrification and disparities in wealth. We've seen the cost of housing in the coastal zone go through the roof, and we've seen an exposed, impoverished political system that in many cases is driven by power and vested interests, as opposed to larger interests of society and the community, he said. So in my mind, we need to figure out how to adapt, but it's so much deeper than that. He pulled out a paper written in 2020 by Brian H. Walker, a renowned ecologist in Australia who poses a broader way of thinking about resilience. Resilience includes knowing when an unwanted transformation is inevitable, and instead deliberately transforming all or parts of the system such that the new system delivers what is valued and wanted. So as a first step, Lester reflected, I think we need to acknowledge and recognize and remember that social institutions are human-created artifacts. They're not rooted in some natural order. All of these debates that we're having along the property of the shoreline, that's really rooted in the original colonialism and the taking of the land by the sovereign and then passing it from the Spanish government to the Mexican government to the US government and establishing the property lines that we are now fighting about up and down the coast. Suing over a homeowner's right to a seawall, debating the costs of managed retreat, these disagreements delay the inevitable need for fundamental change. And I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. So adaptation, ultimately, is about choice. It's about choosing what to preserve, choosing what to let change, and choosing what to intentionally change in a new and reimagined way. To resist change is to miss out on opportunities to create a better future. To remain unchanged is to buy into the long-held myth that the world today is as good as it gets. To ignore this choice to mend our relationship with the land and with each other is to believe that the systems we're still holding on to, systems built on social inequities, 
historical injustices, and the willful control of nature are the way that things should always be. And that is the end of chapter seven, which is what my editor calls the pivot chapter, where chapters, you know, one through six to seven is about like, here's what you think this book is about. And then afterwards, it's like, here, actually, this book is about everything. <laughs> and Charles really expanded the conversation from that. Um, and just this notion of resilience, too, of I think in that conversation, it made me realize that this book ultimately is an exploration of our capacity for change and that change does not have to be uh, scary. And, you know, recognizing that the way we had have been talking about sea level rise in so many of these communities and especially where the, like the tension points are is this still respond like this idea that we are responding to sea level rise like it's a threat that we have to defend against rather than seeing it as an opportunity to possibly re-examine some of the systems that got us here into the first place, you know, whether it's a politi political systems, economic systems, social systems, and ultimately, like, can we reframe this conversation as an opportunity on what we can gain from resetting our relationship to the land, to this dynamic process along the coast? And does it have to be a conversation about what it is that we're going to lose? Because that's, that's where a lot of the fear and the anxiety and the anger comes from, right? Sorry, I'm giving you a lot of thoughts to... <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, well, first of all, you know, I was amazed and honored that you, when I read that, that set a uh, couple of pages, because um, so often you feel like you're going on about that stuff and people aren't really listening to you, right? So it's wah, 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 resilience, resilience. Wah. So it was great that you uh, took that and framed it in the way you did to the, as the as the pivot, you say, to this bigger challenge. And um, I I have been thinking about adaptation in that way f for a while now that it is an opportunity for transformation um, but and part of that's um, you know it's embedded in w my own understanding of what I think is going to happen like Gary Griggs you know a coastal geologist uh, extraordinaire will tell you you can't hold back the Pacific Ocean right and and you just have to walk along the coastline and look at some of these disastrous unfoldings that we're seeing to understand that this is going to happen, and it's going to happen in some big ways, and we can either um, respond to it proactively and think about what the opportunities are for for reimagining a place and how it could work in light of this uh, thing that's happening, or we could, you know, deal with the um, incremental, ad hoc, politicized, disastrous unfoldings that we we see so often. Right, and it, at one level, it's not. Um, it's not rocket science. The water is going up. And the land is, is there, and the water is going up, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse. So how should we respond to that? It's an opportunity to rethink the relationships we have with land right now. Um, the university has all this land, and, there are, and it's happening here, too. I've been working with campus planning on a sea level rise adaptation strategy for the shoreline here. Do we want to have seawalls ringing our campus? I don't think so. Probably nobody would say that. So what do we do instead? Well, I mean, and also for the non-coastal uh, geology folks in the room, I mean, a simple message. I, I feel like I've like also collected just like so many like amazing sound bites and bangers from people <laughs> over the years on like just this book. But someone from Surfrider Foundation actually told me a couple years ago, real simply, like seawalls kill the beaches in front of the seawall. And that was just like such a blunt, direct way of explaining how the minute you try to, again, impose permanence onto this inherently non-static, ever-moving space between land and ocean, you are disrupting that process of sand movement, erosion. And you know what happens when you draw this firm line in the sand, so to speak, is that as the ocean is moving in, it, you know, car it, it carves away and drowns out everything in front of that wall. And then once you're done, once it hits that wall, you see how like a lot of these like rock revetments and seawalls, like the, the beach starts to get really sloped, right? Because the waves are just constantly carving away at the beach. And so someone um, at a different talk asked me to define manage retreat and like kind of on the spot, I was like, whew, now I know how Charles feels all the time. And I was like, managed retreat is just acknowledging ultimately that the ocean is moving in, the coast is supposed to move with it, and we're supposed to move with the coast. And the longer we try to hold this line, the more it's going to cost us. And 
the more we're able to proactively start moving communities and to start thinking about the social consequences and the economic consequences of moving before the disaster hits. That, you know, and, and then ultimately I was like, manage retreat is a process and similar to how the coast is a process. And I think some of the things that I see, the tension points in a lot of these communities that are resistant to change, and again, this book ultimately became an examination of our capacity for change and transformation. It, it kind of is rooted still in this notion that like, A, manage retreat and sea level rise adaptation and responding to sea level rise is this one big scary action that you have to take, whether it's a vote on whether or not to include manage retreat in a planning document or you know, something that, and it, it's all hinged on these like big one-time decisions that feel like it's gonna cost a lot, but actually manage retreat is a multi-year, multi-decade process towards a vision of what the community is choosing to value, right? And yeah, and I would I would say it's always been that way. We we're always changing. Communities are constantly changing, and it's just that we're not old enough or didn't live a hundred years ago to know what it looked like here. Some few people might understand that, but it changed, right? And, and it's going to change. But the, the challenge we have now is, in this particular geographic problem, we exploded our population and built all of this stuff right along the shoreline in a relatively stable period of climate. And now that's changed, and that's accelerating, and we have to deal with the consequences. So change is coming more quickly, um, but to think we aren't going to have to change, I think, is is going to lead to a lot of trouble. Right, and you know, I'm thinking now of AR Siders from University of Delaware and huge, renowned, you know, adaptation specialist, and she said once that you know where we're at right now is basically trying to tell people to eat broccoli 70 years from, uh, so that they won't get a heart attack 70 years from now. But instead, you know, people would rather be eating, you know, fast food and drinking tequila. But, you know, how do you get people to eat their broccoli so that they can prevent the disaster that is, you know, this idea that we know that at some point, 40, 50, 60, 70 years from now, things are going to be different. Like that this idea of permanence isn't something that anyone is saying it will happen and but at the same time we all know that none of these changes need to happen tomorrow and so how do you move from the short term into this like process towards the long term and how do you help more people navigate this middle transition space is kind of where we're stuck right now right and ultimately kind of going back to the passage that i just read what are we trying to hold on to it's the status quo and when we had that conversation, I'm like, oh my God, there are a bunch of people out there who could probably say like the status quo ain't what we want. <laughs> so, you know, and that kind of also helped me expand my reporting to kind of recognize, okay, I've talked to all the people at the table, but who is not at the table that should be at the table who either don't realize they're at the table or have been historically erased from this conversation. And I'm sure these folks have a lot of thoughts on like what's not working in society today and what shouldn't be preserved, you know, in perpetuity in the future with seawalls or whatever, however else we're trying to hold on to this permanence of the status quo that, you know, is ultimately what is grounding some of the most difficult decisions that we're facing right now. And so, you know, it, it is, and you're raising the environmental justice question, or that's one way to frame it, right? Um, are our actions doing right by everyone uh, in this environmental problem? And that's an interesting framing, too, because notwithstanding what I said a few minutes ago, if you, look, if you ask that question and look at managed retreat around the country, you'll see some different responses. So in California, we have a lot of um, affluent property owners who don't want to manage any kind of retreat, right? They're going to stay and as long as they can. Um, but if you look in other communities, like up in Alaska or down in the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana, communities or um, Staten Island have had to move out of necessity or the government is, is actively asking them to move and making them move in some cases. And so the justice question becomes, you're... you're requiring us to leave our homes, our place, um, not necessarily how do we do right by all the other people who want some kind of managed retreat to happen, like in California. We also have communities in California that aren't rich and famous, uh, and we need to pay more attention to how to take care of the most vulnerable first, I think. 
Yeah, and I'm. This is. I have a lot of thoughts now um, circulating in my mind. But I think you know, for so long, this issue did feel like a coastal elite problem, and you know, I, I think in the last few years, it's really expanded, and I've been really encouraged by that. But um, maybe to give an example to like, so I'm the the community that popped into my mind was Marin City. How, how many of you have heard of Marin City as a community in the Bay Area? Yeah, it's like literally the definition of like overlooked, like if you Google map Marin City, Sausalito shows up. They share the same zip code as Sausalito. They share a school district. That school district just got a desegregation order for the like, first time two years ago. And it's a historically black community where um, a lot of folks from the Jim Crow South at the height of World War II kind of came to this area in, like in the Marin County to help with the ship uh, shipbuilding. There was a lot of Liberty ships that were in desperate need post Pearl Harbor. And you know, a lot of this like public housing was slapped together to accommodate this like sudden influx of workers. But then after the war, all the white workers were able to leave, but the black workers were not able to buy property or settle elsewhere. So they kind of stayed in this area that was kind of slapped together at the height of the war with like pretty questionable infrastructure and pipes and stuff like that. And but this community has continued to remain intact. Like I talked to folks, there's a local church leader who was like, you know, really representative of the second and third generation of this community. And, you know, I go into this community, think you look at the geography too and the geology, like Marin City is kind of situated at, at the bottom of a bowl shaped topography. So whenever it rains, it really starts to flood. They have this one trapped wetland on the other side of the freeway that floods every time, that gets backed up every time it rains and every time there's a high tide. And, you know, I go into Marin City years ago as like the bumbling reporter who wants to talk about climate change and sea level rise. And they want to talk about how they, you know, the mysterious cancer risk, uh, rates that are affecting their elders because, and, you know, the, and questioning kind of like whether or not like, like their asthma seems to be a rite of passage for every kid by the time they're in fourth grade. And they they think it's related somehow to the freeway that cuts across their community. And they, and, you know, they're telling me that, they would love to have a park, you know, or some form of green space because if the kids after school had somewhere else to go, like their lives could be completely different based on their after school activities and their ability to reconnect with nature. And they didn't want it, like sea level rise and flooding wasn't like their top priority. And I'm like, these are climate change issues, you know, restoring, bringing green space into a community is you know, good is also a climate change issue. Include, improving air quality and to improve asthma rates is a climate change issue. And like these conversations are, you know, intersecting all these other conversations on resilience and uplifting communities and that are happening in other parts of the state. And, you know, like where am I going with this? I mean, it's just, you know, ultimately, like I think that like these folks weren't necessarily in the conversation a couple of years ago and now they are, but also like, no one wants to move. I think the other thing about Ramirez City that really made me wonder is like, what does it mean to relocate a community? Do you have to relocate? Like, was is Marin City? And you know, Marin City is not even a city. It's unincorporated Marin County. And like, and the other thing that was just stunning to me is like they had all these questions about pollution and all that, but there was no data to prove that they were being exposed to contaminants. But just because there's no data to prove it doesn't mean there isn't a problem. But that is essentially the definition of being overlooked, right? So there is like this increasing movement to help build capacity for Marin City. Um, but again, like, what does it mean to retain a community? What does it mean to re relocate a community? And for Marin City right now, it's like sea level rise has become an opportunity to expedite the cleanup of contaminated soil, to clean up kind of a lot of this legacy pollution that they've been asking for for years, and now sea level rise is kind of accelerating that need to either clean up the land or, you know, the community will probably have to move. And do you have to move the entire community? Like, does the church structure and the, you know, the coffee shop that everyone gathers at, do you have to move that too in order to have that community not be displaced? Because I think a lot of folks, when I talk to them, are worried about being displaced and having nowhere else to go. And as they get in, they're kind of living the genera multi-generational, like, legacy of being redlined and like this fear of not being able to afford anywhere else if they want to stay together or to stay in California. Like those are some really hard social questions that came up as I was starting to expand who we bring into this conversation. Talk about this without bringing up everything, yeah. right? So you're right, nobody wants to move, uh, but 
depending on what else we care about, we might have to move in places. And I don't think that means we're going to move everywhere. Uh, the city of San Francisco is building a huge seawall around its airport. It's going to you know, protect it for another 50 years, maybe. Um, although I think we might be doing vertical takeoffs well before that. Uh, also which looking at like might elevating be a way to the ferry take care building. of the airport and the yeah. wetland out here. Um, so anyway, that's my own personal opinion, not the universities. Um, the uh, you know so it's a challenge. Nobody wants to move, but when you put it up against these other issues like the environmental hazards that might be there, or the affordable housing that might be in the former estuary of the city of Santa Barbara, uh, and how do you deal with that? Uh, the ecologists would want to come in and say, hey, maybe we should restore that estuary. You know why it floods there? Well, it used to be an estuary, right? The water is going trying to go, where, back, to go where back to where it used to go uh, or used to be. And so maybe that's an opportunity to restore a, a wetland system in a place that's a dis more disadvantaged community. But in order to do that, we need to ask ourselves, how are we going to provide for those people to live somewhere else in a, in a, in a right way, in an equitable way, and help that transition happen? Uh, but in another context, and you know, we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but you know, we've had a bill vetoed twice now in the state that would provide loans to communities to do uh, managed buyouts. So uh, loans to the city of Santa Barbara to buy vulnerable properties uh, and then lease them back potentially to make up the revenue to pay for the loan until such time as it was no longer viable and then you could remove the development, right? So it's a way to, as you say, a process over decades, like the life of a mortgage, for example, yeah. to move gradually back. But I'm not sure I'm interested in subsidizing loans to help you know, Malibu move back they could pay for that. Yeah, and I think this is bringing up another question that philosophically was a journey for me, but this idea of fairness, which is different than equity, you know, and equality. And, you know, that bill that you just mentioned, it was introduced by Senator Ben Allen two years in a row. And it kind of, you know, his staff kind of acknowledged that, again, manage retreat and this idea of resetting our relationship to the shoreline is a process and that the biggest sticking point truly is property value. Like what are, what is the, why are, what are we trying, what are, why, why are people fighting? They want to preserve their property value. They are worried that the minute you designate a, a row of homes as ha having to move at some point in the uncertain future, that would affect their ability to refinance their home, get insurance, and they would tank their property value. So that has stopped the ability to even have a conversation about this issue in certain communities. And so Senator Allen and his team kind of looked, they teamed up with um, a bunch of researchers at UCLA and kind of fleshed out this idea that how about, you know, and it's not a one size fits all solution, but how about, you know, whoever, whatever city or community wants to try this, like they can buy out homes that will be need relocated at some point in the future, buy them at market value so it still feels fair, whether it is Malibu homeowner or someone who is in a frontline community, that, you know, be able to compensate them and acknowledge the property value that exists today but probably won't exist in the future if we allow ourselves to dismantle these systems that are maintaining, again, the status quo. Buy them at property value, rent them out as like, you know, kind of like Airbnbs for the next 30 years and recoup the costs of how much it costs to purchase a multi-million dollar home in Malibu. And, you know, when once the ocean gets too close, rather than build a seawall and start all these domino effects and unintended consequences, let's just dismantle the homes and turn it back into a wetland or a dune. And it's interesting, the question of fairness came up a lot, like whether or not this was fair for taxpayers to pay for a buyout of a $10 million home in Malibu and whether or not this money should be directed only to communities that are defined as environmental justice communities. But the flip side of it, too, is that this is where I'm wearing my reporter hat. You know, I don't think we can move forward on this issue without the wealthiest, most influential, most politically powerful folks along the coast kind of being on board. And I, I feel like hearing Senator Allen talk about how this was one way to at least start moving towards that process while 
allowing folks. To, to, that was his stab at attempting the politics of, you know, the wealth and on, honestly the question of property value that has been stumping this issue. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. No, I, I agree. I, I agree, and um, you, you know, you don't have to subsidize the loans of the rich and famous. You just set up the system so that it's progressive, right? You help people who need help, and the others can, you know, carry the freight on the loan. But you could still have the system that moves people back, I think. So, um, so much of it is about property, but it's also about, you know, having spent 20 years as a regulator, it's also about the um, laws of society that we decide we want to enforce. And so right over here in Isla Vista, Santa Barbara County has an ordinance that requires uh, the property owners on Del Playa to potentially cut their apartment buildings off to move them back from the cliff edge. Uh, and that's an ordinance. And you know it, it establishes a set of costs for a, a landowner. And you either comply or you, or you have issues <laughs> with the county, right? And so they end up paying for it, but maybe that gets reflected in a rent, uh, gets passed on through the market. But you can um, encourage behavior through the rules that we impose. One of the um, things I've focused on in the last few years is this idea of the public tide lands or the public trust. And if you want to talk about a, a storm of conflict that's coming, you just need to understand that um, we all own the tide lands, right? Below the mean high tide is public land in California. Well, that mean high tide line is moving. It's always moved, right? It ebbs and flows with the tide, with the tides and the seasons uh, and with the um, celestial cycles. But now it just so happens it's moving you know, you know, one, one direction. It's moving in and we can't stop that. So what I've been looking at is, well, what do we do when that line inevitably intersects with private property? We have uh, 40 million people in California who might come up and say, hey, you know what? Your house is on my land. What are we going to do about that? That's a lot of litigation in my mind. And so one of the reasons to get ahead of this is to avoid that conflict. Yeah, and again, it's all connected. So I don't right? need to buy that land. I'm just going to say, get off of my land. Well, and that's like, you know, this it's all semantics, right? Like manage retreat versus unmanage retreat. Some of it is also, um, I, I feel like there's like a lot of interesting examples that are now coming to light in other parts of the country too, where like, um, these two houses are way far out, like, you know, way exposed to the ocean and the road, the main public road that the a county agency has to maintain gets flooded 10 times a month now. And at one point they're going to be like, we're going to stop protecting this road and you're on your own with your house. And like, you know, that's kind of also a future that I kind of see if we continue to un not manage this process, right? And what you just said with the ordinance and that's a, ultimately a practice of vision, right? And a practice of acknowledging what the community values and even what you just said about the public versus private kind of property line that is moving and that where so many folks are still trying to hold the line on, that ultimately could either be managed or it could be complete chaos, you know, and. Right, so talk, I'm just a little aware of the time. Um, vision is really important in my mind to, to how we deal with this and, and move forward. Vision at the community level but also visioning with the layers of society that we have to deal with. And uh, in California, that includes the state, right? You can't do this without talking to the state. So vision is important. But um, going back to this idea of transformation, uh, which raises the question, you know, vision of uh, transformation to what? what are, and you're saying we can't hold the line in the sand. It's a dynamic system. So talk about... Um, how do we know what to change to? And you, I think you have something on restoration. This idea of restoration has been common. We, we're all, or most of us are probably familiar with the North Campus restoration that's been so successful. Um, we took back a golf course, the upper estuary, turned it back into a, an ecological system or, or, yeah, on its way. 
So it's, do you want to talk? Do yeah, you and I think talk about you know, that for a minute. I, I appreciate you reminding me of that because I think another word that I really struggled with was the word restoration in this journey. Because what are you restoring something to? Because that notion of and what's like what is the baseline? And you case gave of me managed the word, retreat, right? You know, is a transformation of a, a section of shoreline. It could also be thought of as a restoration. And you gave me the word transformation because I was, as I was learning what, thinking about the word restoration, I'm like, I can't use this word because what we're not, none of what we're doing is restoration. Even if it's like this used to be a wetland, now it's a shopping mall, and now we want to make it a wetland again. Like that isn't like, and what does the restoration look like? And then. I have followed quite a few wetland restoration projects where it's still in limbo 40 years later because folks can't decide what to restore it back to. And this idea of restoring it back to something in, in essence begs a lot of questions. So I was on this journey in search for different words. Charles gave me transformation. And um, yeah, thank you for reminding me. There's a, can I read another quick passage from the book? This is from chapter um, nine. And And so kind of in this chapter, I go to the salt ponds in the South Bay of San Francisco Bay and kind of this notion of restoring wetlands and how this question again of what you restore it back to and the permitting process and kind of this exercise of visioning and transforming a landscape. So I'm talking to Sam Shuckett, who was the head of the Coastal Conservancy, the State Coastal Conservancy for a very long time. And he kind of helped me think about the word restoration and um, and the, it, it starts to bring together a lot of different pieces from the book as well. So um, let me see where to start. In the same way it can take forever to build a strip mall in California, with studies and lawsuits and a half dozen agencies unable to agree on a plan, rebuilding a wetland had also become a bureaucratic nightmare. The original goal of 100,000 acres was motivated by nostalgia to rewild the bay and restore things to the way they were before. Some conservationists are still wedded to this plan forged during simpler times, while others cannot agree on how to reconceive the land. How do you bring back the past while making sure it will survive a future that we still don't understand? Is the restoration authority even doing restoration anymore? The word restore is tricky, Shuket said, because it implies that there is a rolling back of the clock. And of course, the first thing we learned is that nowhere in California can we restore things exactly to the way they were. What is even the baseline? And in the face of climate change, does it even matter? The answers continue to vary when people consider this question, but ecological restoration at its core should be a practice of hope. Hope that it is still possible to live in a way that sustains both the human and more than human world. The Chumash speak of reciprocity. Christina Hill envisions adaptation in place. And Charles Lester, now guiding the future of coastal planning from his post at UC Santa Barbara, urges deliberate transformation. Back by the sewage smelling pond in Marin City, Shannon Lee Bynum had used the word rejuvenation. To him, restoration meant rebirth, rebirth for the land and for his community. Rather than fixate on which baseline to return to, he was choosing to heal, to renew dignity, to imagine what the shore could be. We can't take back the decades of pain that have already been inflicted upon a place and its people, but we can stop the bleeding and avoid a future that leads to new wounds. There's a notion in Buddhism that rebirth calls for both shedding and embracing the traumas of our past. Can the Bay Area's largest remaining wetlands also be reborn? As we try to reconcile the damages to the land, perhaps we could redefine the restoration happening at Alviso as a way to adapt and move on. Rather than build more walls the army way or unwind the clock to some romanticized concept of rewilding, the rebirth now underway shows what living with sea level rise could look like without sacrificing either nature or community. The wetlands of Alviso cannot be merely restored. In the face of rising floods, they must be transformed. Reading this passage is actually really reminding me that for a while I was like, you know, F restoration, I'm not using that word, I'm gonna use reconceive, you know, you know, reconceive felt a little bit better for me and then I heard Charles be like, transformation, I'm like, yeah, that's a great word and then, um, talking to, and then there was, you know, one of the folks in Marin City as we're walking along this like trapped wetland, he was telling me about how he felt like restoring this wetland could be rejuvenating for his community. And that led to the word rebirth. And then all, I actually, we, we share a lot of kind of Buddhism um, background, but just, and then the idea of rebirth, I was like, oh my God. And that's when like, 
the poetry part of me came out. And I was like, there's so much we can say about the word rebirth. So now I'm thinking about all these different words to talk about restoration. And ultimately, it comes down to transformation towards a future that we don't quite understand yet. But you know, we should be brave and we should embark on this journey. And I think it is possible. It's just even if it is kind of scary. And so do I have time for one more question? So. Um towards the back of the book then you start you talk a little bit more about these visions and different transformations that are happening in different places and how that might happen and um, you know partly based on my exposure to political science I'm, I'm interested in um, this challenge uh, towards the end you say and, and throughout the book there are different references to like we're being driven by our incremental worst impulses you know the uh, to protect property, maximize profit, these sorts of things. Um, and then you say, uh, talking about the Cassia story, you know, that transformation effectively is possible when the social will exists. And you say property by property, uh, when, we want, when we want to as a society, we find a way to share. Property by property, beach by beach, each incremental effort to be a better guest by the water is an act of hope toward the greater whole. Later on, um, past triumphs of collective action will the coastal act into existence. We didn't get to that. Maybe we will in questions. But um, as an example of collective action, we all said, you know, we want to protect our coast, save our coast. Um, the little town of Marina banded together. Communities like Deep East Oakland stand ready to heal the shore if only more people in power would listen. So what do you mean by that? How much time do we have? <laughs> this is the part of the conclusion of the book. I mean, I... It's interesting because, like, I think we were also reflecting a lot, you know, before we started this talk, too, on, like, what, what, what do we actually need to move towards change. I think, you know, as I was, re I was reflecting on this on my drive up to Santa Barbara, and I think um, compromise was a word that kind of came to mind, but what you just said reminded me, like sharing, like our will to share and our will to redistribute power and to share power. I mean, that is really core to like a lot of these conversations. And I think I've been seeing kind of this awakening in a lot of different spaces. So like a Biden-Trump ticket? <laughs> But even what you were just saying with like deep East Oakland, I mean, I think like this idea, this notion of active listening and kind of recognizing that how we value expertise and who we center in these conversations are all super important. And that, you know, we already have things like the Coastal Act, for example, that give us kind of a framework to move more collectively and to honor compromise and sharing and kind of redistributing the way we cl lay claim to certain aspects of the coast and what we want from the coast. And um, I'm trying to avoid getting too meta and too philosophical. But well, I think at one point you said share power. It's a, what we need to do is start sharing power more. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, I think for, for me as a reporter, I see sharing power as, you know, making sure that I give voice to the folks who don't usually get to be centered in the conversation. Because when you quote someone, you do give them power. I think that, you know, you mentioned the Kashaya. I think acknowledging, for example, the indigenous ways of living and, and the communities along the coast that are, like the indigenous communities, so many along the California coast were first pushed out and now priced out. And what does it mean to bring them back to the coast and to acknowledge that we shouldn't be talking about indigenous communities as just some romanticized point in the past, but that they're still here today and that they have a role in this conversation and that they are critical to the way we move into the future. I see that as sharing power from like my perspective. Um, or, or even just affordable housing. Most yeah. people don't know the original Coastal Act had affordable housing in, the, in there as a requirement because it's a form of coastal access. What's the best way to get access to the coast? Live nearby. And who wields all the power politically in this conversation right now? Like, it's a lot of it is affected by the people who wield the most influence along some of the most expensive, you know, parts of 
California, like wealthy coastal homeowners still have an outsized influence on a lot of the politics in this. And what does it mean to share power? I think some of like, also like what we were talking about creating, like actually sitting down as a community to think about what we value, what we want going into the future, that, that visioning process is also an act, a practice of redistributing power in some ways. And we just said about affordable housing too, like there's just so many things in our system that are built on inequities that could, that that merit some re-examination. And again, responding to sea level rise could be an opportunity to look back and re-examine these systems that again brought us here into the first place. And um, trying to not be too radical, but Charles is also most like one of the most quietly radical people I know. And I'm about to walk away from this okay, conversation so with here, a lot of things to think about. Here's a radical thought that I, <laughs> keep repeating over and over and over. I don't think it's that radical. We need to sit down and talk to each other and figure out what our shared interests are and then hash it out. It's not easy, uh, but yeah, it does require sharing power. That's the radical part. Um, we need to distribute power more and have these community conversations in a way that results in a collective path forward. Everybody's talking about adaptation pathways. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. You have to figure out where you want to go. And I would say, like, and going back to kind of what we were talking about with Senator Allen's bill, and one of the things that surprised me the most, actually, in this process was recognizing how much commonality we actually all have, even with folks that you think would be resistant to something. And it, a lot of it required, you know, second and third and fourth conversations, but this notion of building trust and taking the time to first, you know, validate even like a homeowner's like fear and anxiety over why they're resisting a managed retreat policy. And just, you know, first validating their emotions and then, you know, really starting the conversation not with why are you in denial of sea level rise or why are you why why do you why are you opposed to XYZ, but being like, what are you afraid of? And like what what is it that is like making this hard for you? Like those are different ways to enter the same conversation. And for me, I, I was really pleasantly surprised by how much commonality folks had in terms of what they actually wanted for the coast, why they loved the coast, and the shared actually like connection to the ocean. And that crosses political parties and, you know, different, it, like every person I talked to had some beautiful story of why they care about the coast and why they connect to the ocean and why they moved there, bought a property there, saved up their whole life to buy, you know, the ugliest house on the prettiest street in town, you know, or have sought their whole lives to try to get to the beach. Like, they, we have so much shared connection, and I also hope that you feel that in this book. And that's, I do feel hope that, like, somehow we'll move forward together and that, you know, as long as we stop, like you said, and listen to each other and talk to each other and break down some of these silos, um, there is a way forward. And... Yeah. It's like really still such a surreal experience for me to be asked questions rather than be the person asking questions. And, <laughs> and it's, it is just, uh, I feel like I should have started with my disclaimer. I realized as I started talking more about this book and I'm, I've been on the road kind of trying to start more conversations about sea level rise, I realized that I talk in no way like the way I write. I talk like my first draft, which is pure chaos and run on sentences. And I usually find my thought about five minutes into my ramble. And then, you know, for me, the magic in my writing is the revision and the self-editing. But you can't really do that when you're talking live. So welcome to the first draft of my thoughts and my hot takes that Charles has prompted out of me. I'll give you a strike out of that later. <laughs> I, had a, I had a question. Um, the Coastal Commission, I think I know the answer, but are they catering to a private interest? Are they catering to the community? And what does the book say specifically about that? So the question is, do I need to repeat the question? Did, or are we, could you hear me? I don't, wasn't sure. Oh, I'll say it again. Does the Coastal Commission cater to private interests more than the community? And what does the book say specifically about the Coastal Commission? Okay, so I feel like you should is answer viable, that question. Is it a viable organization. 
So there's a whole chapter on the Coastal Commission and the Coastal Act. And fun fact, the chapter almost got cut from my book editors. Like, we don't need a whole chapter on a law. This is too boring. And people just want to. And I was just and I was like, no, this is the most important chapter ever. And this is like a really it's really important to know like, it's such a unique law, the way we manage our coast and protect our coast. And this the Coastal Commission, in my mind, has always walked this really tense and ever dynamic line between this question of fairness and juggling private and public interest along the coast. Um, and so my editor cut it, I put it back in, she cut it again. And she was like, okay, if you want this whole chapter on the Coastal Act, rather than have it be like a, a embedded in a different chapter, just got to make it interesting. So I was like, challenge accepted. And since this book came out, the number of folks who have told me it's their favorite chapter or their like most interest. I've had, I've sent so many screenshots to my book editor being like, they love the Prop 20 chapter. They love the Coastal Act chapter. But um, to your question, I mean, I think, so there's a whole chapter on the history of the Coastal Act, why it was created in the first place, how the commission actually works. And then I would say throughout the book, it really starts to examine the Coastal Act as a living document and a living philosophy that's constantly changing. Because the Coastal Act was passed and uh, written in the 1970s before sea level rise was really a, an issue that was front of mind. So I do think the way we interpret the law, the way the Coastal Commission, who is the, you know, the guardians of this law, are um, interpreting and enforcing the spirit of the act has continued to evolve. And I think the book kind of attends to that. I would say specific one example that popped into mind the minute you asked your question about protecting private homeowners versus um, the public interest. I mean, philosophically, the Coastal Act's main premise is that the coast belongs to everyone. There's no such thing as a private beach and that the, the coast itself is a broader public good that should be preserved. But then you can get into the weeds of like who defines the public, who is who is everyone and who is all. And um, there's is a case preserved for present and future generations. Right. And also, and so I think seawalls is a flashpoint and, you know, whether or not a seawall to protect a private property and a private property line as the public trust line is moving inland from sea level rise, that's a question that the Coastal Commission has had to wrestle with. And they have continued to adopt resolutions and respond to, you know, this growing issue that used to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, and they're now doing it more. There, there's more of an um, effort and resolutions passed on how to be more um, specific about that kind of implementation. I, yeah, there's a lot of questions. I don't know if you wanted to add to kind of just like this but, line well, that I, the commission has to walk to balance what it means to protect the coast and to steward the coast for everyone, yeah. for the public. Well, I think what you said is, is right, that it, the law is rooted in a public interest movement. We had a grassroots movement in 1972 passed a proposition to set up the law. And the law is fundamentally about protecting things that are defined as everyone's of common shared interests in public access to and along the shoreline. The public was concerned that they couldn't get to the beach anymore because houses were going up cheek to jowl blocking the beach. Uh, they were concerned about the loss of views. They were concerned about the loss of wetlands and habitats, all of these things that they wanted to preserve our, we all have that shared interest, right? There is inevitably a conflict with private interests. And I, I, I can see at least one person in the room who might say that the Coastal Commission, you know, spends too much time catering to private interests in these individual decisions. But they have to do that because it's land use. It's about deciding whether you can build a house in a place or not, or whether you can make a house bigger or uh, you know, any kind of use of a particular space. So it's inherently a conflict between often private interests and the larger public interest. It's also a conflict from the beginning between state interests, statewide interests in protecting the coast and local interests. So one of the biggest conflicts inherent in the law is between the Coastal Commission and City of Santa Barbara, for example. Although City of Santa Barbara is not a great example because they're so progressive. Um, and <laughs> So there's this tension between local government saying, we don't want the state telling us what to do with our community and what the state overall is trying to do to protect everybody's interests. The people from inland California who want to be able to come to the beach and not be kept out by the people who are fortunate enough to be able to live at the beach. Right, and it's like, you know, 
it's one giant landscape that we all belong to that with an ocean that cares about does not care about city boundaries or property lines but then there is also no one size fits all solution for any community or property so i think the coastal commission is at this interesting point of juggling all of that and I think more than anything, I feel like I should say this more often, the Coastal Commission is so understaffed and underfunded for how big their mission is. I'm constantly floored by just um, the relatively few number of folks who are like also a lot of lifers there who have been there since the Coastal Act was first passed, who are who have tr truly been the guardians of this mission that was bestowed, you know, that was demanded by the public in the 70s. And I mean, I get overwhelmed just trying to travel up and down this 1,200-mile coastline, and then I think about how much work it takes to manage and to you know be on top of every single one of these cases. But it's been a, it's been really um, fascinating to follow, and I do think that again, the Coastal Act is to me a living document that continues to be evolving with the times and you know all the problems that sea level rise is now intensifying and accelerating before us and one other point on your question about is the law you know is it time to get rid of it or, or is the coastal commission a viable body um you know politically it is a political body at one dimension and so the commissioners themselves are political appointees but that appointment process is split across three authorities the governor the assembly and the senate so no one political actor controls what the coastal commission does it's not like the department of fish and wildlife that has to answer to the governor only okay, on policy, right? Uh, the governor can maybe tell four commissioners what to do, but not all of them. Uh, and so it reflects our politics, but it also has an independence. That's why it's called a quasi-independent commission, because it is making its decisions as a commission based on the facts and the, the uh, law that it's presented in any given case. So there's, that independence, I think, is really an effective piece of the process, which has enabled it to adapt. Uh, it has ebbed and flowed, for sure. I mean, yeah. no one knows that better than me, right? I was about to say. But um, that would be an ebb, I think. <laughs> A king low tide. Yeah. No comment. This is being thank, recorded. You, thank you for reaffirming to me that the Coastal Act chapter needed to be fought for. And I will report back to my editor tonight. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to to have you on campus. Um, and, and forgive me if this is sort of covered in the book, but you know, I feel like a lot of what we've sort of discussed in this last hour is a lot about like owners, right? And people who live and own homes and all that kind of stuff. And I was curious um, in your coverage, if you look at renters' rights, right? What's kind of happening when renters are displaced from these areas, right? Who's, who's paying for them to move to somewhere else? Um, it's just what I'd love to hear a little bit about. Yeah, and I think that's... Not that I'm going to write a second book because <laughs> uh, that would be very intimidating. But I think there's so many questions that I wish I had gotten more into. But I think what Charles alluded to with the fact that we, um, right after the Coastal Act was passed, immediately the, the rush to gut the, the law was immense. And one of the things that did succeed within the first few sessions of the legislature after the Coastal Act was to gut the Coastal Commission's ability to manage, to, you know, demand affordable housing and to have in their, you know, purview ensuring that coastal access involved the, you know, the right to live on the coast for more people and to make it affordable. I think with renters, it is interesting because we do talk, I, I think that a lot of the tension points still remain in property owners fighting to protect property value. And I think your point about renters' rights is really important. And I think I also think about, you know, we were talking way earlier about cost-benefit analyses and how we assign value, right? Some of the early cost, the way we kind of calculated um, what happens if we do this and it would cost X amount, we would lose X amount of property if we don't build this, if we don't do this. And we valued property in a way that was assigning market value and whatever, but did we value, how did we value the beach as a recreation place? How did we value the beach as a source of, you know, uh, like source of uh, relief from a heat wave for inland communities like that. We don't have actual like values to assign to that. And so I think and how do we 
beyond the way we tend to just assign value to property and infrastructure, how much infrastructure costs, right? And like the opportunity cost of like removing this critical infrastructure or whatever. Like I think there are so many more things that are less tangible that I think in the last few years, we've had a lot more robust conversations. I think the fact that there are more social science folks kind of entering this conversation beyond kind of this strict engineering approach is assigning value to all these less tangible social goods. And I think renter's rights is one of them. And just as you were talking though, I was thinking about like all the folks who don't live on the coast who have a right to go to the coast and we haven't assigned value historically in a way that, I mean, you you probably have a lot more. I mean, I know the Coastal Commission has tried to do this too. Um, well, but they, they did do it. They required inclusionary housing in the first few years. That's right. why they got gutted, right? Because yeah. they were actually saying, yeah, you have to provide that. Um, but I think uh, when you frame it as a renter's question, to me it goes back to this point earlier that everything's connected, right? We can't talk about sea level rise and adaptation without talking about housing. Mm -hmm. It also relates to visioning f for me because I would say, um, you know, people come and go. And by the way, on the question of moving, you know, people are moving all the time. There's many more people moving to different places than we're telling they have to move off the coast right? Right. for a lot of reasons. And that movement is structured by the economy and social factors and all kinds of things. Renters are going to come and go, especially at a place like Isla Vista, where you got a four-year cycle of students coming in and going out and coming in. So the question for me is, you know, what kind of community do we imagine in terms of the uh, who is able to live there, where they're able to live, the conditions of their living environment, like the Isla Vista from what I understand, I haven't lived there, but I understand, you know, it's not necessarily uh, a sprawling single family home with, right? It's, uh, there are a lot of issues about housing. And so to me, the it's about visioning what kind of community we want. And we have a market-based system whereby if there's one real gap in what the Coastal Act has not been able to do, it's been the coast is gentrified, right? Um, we control growth in the coastal zone, so we build less, and money talks. And if you don't have money, you don't live in the coastal zone. Yeah. That's our vision right now. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we have a different vision? And if so, how do we get there? You know, a certain senator, right, or Senator Wiener right now is saying that you need to get rid of the Coastal Commission in order to have affordable housing in the coastal zone. I'm skeptical. This is where, this is, you're watching in live time how Charles is giving me like 5,000 things to think about when I go home. But um, as you're talking and as I'm thinking on your question, I'm about to get, I don't want to get too radical, but I think, you know, one thing that really moved me the more I, you know, talked to folks is recognizing too that, you know, land ownership, this idea of being of settling somewhere and owning a home and having this property be exactly the way it is and accrue value for the next generation, for your grandkids. I don't see that in younger generations. This idea of owning property is less, um, you know, less of a, less, that, that idea of the American dream or the California dream, like I don't see that as much in younger folks. And I'm overgeneralizing here, but you know, part of like, what does it mean to transform? What does it mean to adapt? What does it mean to reset our relationship to land? might also require us to rethink our relationship to property ownership. And then my mind is now jumping to kind of, um, again, kind of thinking about who we recenter and who we, who, whose voices we give power to. Like I, I was moved by a number of conversations with indigenous um, community members throughout this book. And the, the, a t someone who was Tongva introduced the word guest to be a guest on the land. And, Kuyam is the word for guest in Tonva. And it's just like that small shift in like, and it's just the number of like younger folks who really don't think about home as being tied to a place, of being rooted to your community. And you are able to move, like the people that cycle in and out of Isla Vista, like your attachment to a settled place and a place that we claim permanence to is different, I think, when I speak to different generations. And this idea of being a guest of the land that we reside on you don't, if you're a guest in someone's home, you don't immediately go in and rearrange the furniture or take, you know, or eat all the food out of the fridge immediately. And like, yeah, just this notion of like dismantling our relationship to property ownership and our expectation of property ownership and being a guest of the land, all of that kind of also ties to like renters, right? And the way we 
have detached our emotional attachment to place in a way that I think could be transformative as well. And this is a half-baked thought. Wait for the actual article that comes out once I edit I've, myself. I've been um, fortunate to get involved in some work in Guam doing sustainability planning. And uh, the Chamorro culture is the indigen original indigenous culture there. And they have this notion of um, you're borrowing the, the land you're on or have. Is you're borrowing it from the future. I love that. And that's this idea of, um, you know, you're, you're taking care of the place in a, in a transition through time. It's not yours in some static, unchanging sense, right? Yeah. It's, it's the future's. And I love, too, that we were just starting to talk about this, that your work is now taking you to Guam and recognizing that this is not just a California issue. It's an everywhere issue. And um, I want to ask you another question now. It's like, I, where do we go from here? Like, what are your next steps in California or globally on sea level rise adaptation? I feel like this book is a summary of, like, the last six years on this issue. It's hoping to open a conversation on where we go from here, but, you know, ultimately trying to write an ending to this book was hard because how do you end a book about an issue where the ending is still yet to be written depending on the decisions that we make today so and a lot of those decisions are going to be guided by folks like you so like where what are your next questions or your next steps and with the you know ocean and coastal policy center and the beach resilience whatever you're willing to share on the record at this point i'm i'm recording now so <laughs> focused entirely too much on me. Um, and I take issue with your idea that there's some some point which we actually figure this out, right? So It's a process. It's a process, and it's always going to be that way, and it's always going to be a cycle of regeneration uh, and transformation. So, you know, you we work on the problems in front of us while we're here, and hopefully we do that with an eye towards the people who are going to be here next. Is, is kind of the way I think about it. And so um, I'd like to have a future where there are sandy beaches uh, functioning relatively naturally, whatever that means, um, for my kids' kids. Uh, so what am I working on next? I'm at the center. We're actually going to be starting a, a major project for the state uh, doing a California beach resiliency plan. and. Uh, getting underway later this year. Some of the people in the room are going to be helping. Uh, so it's a UCSB, uh, USGS, CSU Channel Islands, Point Blue is an NGO that does ecological work in coastal systems. Um, multidisciplinary. Uh, we'll have an EJ component, environmental justice component, a tribal cultural component. But understanding um, for all of you wetlands people out there, the functions and values of beaches, including the social functions and values, how do we try to keep them resilient? So we have, we're going to be coming back to you to figure out what that means. I, I have so many questions, but I'm going to allow other Sorry. people to ask questions because this is when I go into question mode. Okay, I'm going. I um, really enjoyed this talk. Thank you so much. And um, I'm fascinated listening to your observations of the coast. And, you know, I've heard you say, Sensible legislation can't pass. Agencies can be too bureaucratic. Where do the opportunities lie for the average citizen? Where can we affect change? I love that question. Could I? I feel like there was one. Could you ask your question, and then we have another question, and then maybe we'll try to end. Like I, I'd love to hear everyone's questions. And but I, where do the opportunities lie? Would you like to ask your question? Just. The Los Angeles Times is not the only newspaper that's beleaguered these days. How do you sustain your kind of reporting uh, in a beleaguered journalism? Okay, so that's a question over a drink afterwards, but that was a <laughs> question on how to sustain journalism. So, <laughs> And then there was another question from Professor Valentine. I have a lot of voice. I don't think I need it. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, my, my question was about, um, you know, the sort of two end members of, what I think of as legislated retreat uh, and litigated retreat. And um, you know, what, where are the opportunities, particularly on the legislated retreat side, what does that look like? What is legislation that actually addresses this issue directly? I, you talked about one example, um, and I'm curious about what, uh, you know, what a bigger 
picture would look like for that. And, and I just want to say, I wanted to be on this, the asking question side for once. <laughs> <laughs> I just asked Professor Valentine a bunch of questions earlier today on chemicals and the legacy that we have left with our <laughs> environment on uh, forever chemicals. But OK, so I'm going to ask answer your journalism question over drinks after. <laughs> um, Opportunities, do you want to take this question? And I feel like that, that segues into, I feel like legislated retreat and litigated retreat are great new terms for managed retreat. <laughs> um, thank you for expanding our vocabulary. And I think they relate to opportunities, <laughs> both of them. Um, I, I see the um, opportunities are in thinking about some, both of those pathways, uh, but maybe stepwise. So. Um, the state of Hawaii has passed a disclosure law uh, based on a defined sea level rise hazard zone that they've mapped around the island. And we could do the same thing. We've done it basically here in California. But they've required real estate disclosure if you're in that zone, right? And though it's, a, it's an incremental step, uh, the economists should love it because last I heard, e efficiency requires perfect information. So... You want property owners to understand what the hazards are with their property, and you could do it statewide. Uh, that would be a step towards um, affecting the market values by maybe getting people to think a little harder about what they're buying when they buy it. Uh, it's not going to change everything. but So there are um, incremental programs you could begin to put in place from a legislative standpoint. Um, a lot of it, I think, legislatively, it's actually local, so people like... Uh, the planning, the board of supervisors and the city councils need to uh, put in place programs at the community level, land use planning programs to facilitate this change over time. It's not a one shot deal. Right. And I think this is reminding me, there are also so many opportunities to have more conversations, which we talked about with this disclosure, like laws that are happening in Hawaii. You know, again, there, we're, there's more commonality in all these different groups and quote unquote sides of an issue. And I'm remembering now there's a real estate broker that I interview and she's in the book, but she was like real estate brokers who are kind of usually put into the camp of like anti anything and pro property rights and maintaining property value. Um, she was saying it's actually really hard to not have a disclosure law because as a broker, you're kind of put in this really crappy position where you can't over disclose if you're representing the seller. And you know, as it's, it's, you basically screw one side or the other, and so having a disclosure, clean rules, like real estate is actually just a, a system of clean transactions and perfect information, right? So there's a lot of again commonality in some of these conversations that I'm having with folks on quote unquote different sides of the issue. Another uh, legislative, like couple thoughts on the legislative retreat or legislative legislation ideas and opportunities. Um, Senator Laird just passed the bill. I mean, we have a lot of questions too on like how that's going to be implemented. But a new law just got introduced um, that was that all coastal communities in the coastal zone have to come up with a sea level rise plan by 2034. And I mean, the question there is, how are we going to enforce it? And um, but with the Coastal Act, which <laughs> required that all local governments have an LCP by 1981, which is a local coastal and plan, and we still have. Um, 25% of the coast doesn't have one. But that's an example, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm optimistic here, but that's an example of like, I think there are so many communities that are still not even starting the conversation about, okay, let's acknowledge that the sea is rising. What do we do about it? Here are some options. Let's do a vulnerability assessment. And I think the fact that we have a law now that is requiring you know, all communities in the coastal zone to start this conversation, I think is a small step forward, but for that at every community in California. Right. And also on campus, I, I should have mentioned that we've been working on the sea level rise strategy for the campus, uh, which is also an opportunity to get involved in how you think this thing ought to unfold. Yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately ha forcing these conversations, because it's shocking how many communities still, you know, refuse to even begin these conversations. And then, you know, I also think opportunities kind of going back to a lot of the really powerful like justice conversations I've been having, there are communities that have been waiting for years 
for a, a super fun type site to be cleaned up. And now with sea level rise kind of accelerating the fact that this contaminated land that was capped by a layer of concrete in the 80s, you know, because that's how historically generally we would cap, we would, we would clean a contaminated site, a former industrialized site, by capping it with concrete rather than cleaning the chemicals in the soil. And now with the water moving back into filled in marshes and where the water used to be and wants to go back to, that's raising another a bunch of questions. And I think there are a lot of opportunities to clean up a lot of the land that has been you know, degraded or contaminated and has been putting a lot of communities at risk of, you know, health exposures. And I think sea level rise, that intersection of like what we can do to respond to sea level rise could also, those are opportunities to bring more folks to the conversation and also to do a lot of healing along the land. Um, I had another thought on legislation, but I'm blanking right now, so. Thank you for your question. <laughs>